Hi everyone, I'm Dr. J.B. Dias. I serve as Vice President for Education and Curriculum Development at the Herbie Hancock Institute of Jazz. And today we're going to talk about how jazz works. In other words, how jazz musicians can take a single sheet of music and make a whole arrangement of it spontaneously, on the spur of the moment. Because they understand how jazz works, they've listened to a lot of jazz, and they've practiced a lot. Think of jazz like any other language, like French, Spanish, English, Mandarin, Japanese, whatever. When you're having a conversation, you are deciding what you are going to say depending on what everyone else says. And the same thing happens in jazz. Now, if you're having a conversation, you need to know the subject matter. And jazz musicians, when they're having their musical conversation, they need to know the tune they're playing. And when I say the tune, not just the melody, but the chord progression that goes along with the melody. This is a lead sheet for a very famous uh, jazz tune called Tenor Madness. It's by Sonny Rollins, who's a famous tenor saxophonist. That's why it's called Tenor Madness. And as you see, this is just one piece of music, one sheet of music, and it's all that everybody in the band needs. So it could be the trumpet part, it's also the saxophone part, uh, trombone, piano, bass, guitar, drums, vocalist if there's a vocalist, because they study jazz and they know what to do with it. So every jazz tune has a form. Now the form of this tune is what we call a 12 bar blues. It just has 12 measures in it. If you notice, we have bar lines right here. These are bar lines and they connect the measure. So here's the first bar, the second bar, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth measures. And jazz musicians just call measures bars. So there's twelve bars in this tune. So if you're tapping your feet with the music, you're going to play four beats. You're going to tap four beats in each measure, like this. So if I put on my metronome here, and it taps four beats in each measure, you would be going like this. First measure, second measure, third measure, fourth measure, and so forth. And the melody would sound something like this. One, two, ready, go. So what that was right there was the first four measures. This time I'll count the measures as they go by. One, two, ready, go. First measure, second measure, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and so forth. Now, what you see above the melody are the chord symbols. These symbols tell the pianist and the guitarist and let everybody know what the pianist and guitarist are playing and the, and the bass player too because the bass player is going to play the root of those chords. But before I go on any further, I just want to make sure you understand what jazz musicians mean when they say a chord. So a chord is just more than one note played at the same time. So if I were to play just a single note like this, that would just be a single note. And if I were to play three separate notes, that would just be three separate notes. But if I play them all at the same time, it's a chord. And we just call that a basic triad. Triad because it's got three notes. And if I play four notes, well, it's just four separate notes. But if I play them at the same time, we call that a basic seventh chord. And that's a B flat seventh chord because the root of the chord is B flat. Now, if the piano player is playing a B flat seventh chord, the bass player down here plays a B flat in the bass to give it more body. So here's a B flat seven without the bass and with the bass. And here's an E flat seventh chord and a B flat seventh chord. And here's a G seventh chord. And here's a C minor chord, and here's an F seventh chord, and here's a B flat seventh chord. Now, those are the only chords that are listed on that page. 
Now, what jazz musicians will do, rather than just playing the four basic notes that are in that chord, they can put the notes in any order they want. So here we have B flat, D, F, and A flat. They can mix it up like D, F, A flat, and B flat. Notice it's the same notes. They can put it in any inversion they want, but they can also add more notes to it to make it sound hipper. So here's just the regular B flat seventh chord, and here's a jazz version of the same chord. Notice how much fuller and hipper it sounds than just the straight B flat seventh chord. Here's a B flat seventh chord, here's a jazz version again. Same chord, same vibe, just hipper. Now here's another version of the same chord. And jazz musicians know dozens and dozens of ways to play each chord. That's also another, vo we call a voicing of the chord. And they know dozens of ways to play that chord and they can make up some as they go along as well. So you have B flat seven for the first measure, E flat seven for the second measure, B flat seven for the third and fourth measures then E flat 7 for the next two, then B flat 7, G7, C minor, F7, B flat 7, G7, C minor, F7. Notice that these chords are going to get just two beats a piece. Remember, there's four beats in each measure. So these are going to get just two beats a piece. Now, look down here. You have the same chords down here as you have up here. Notice B flat 7 for the first measure up here. B flat 7 for the first measure down there. E flat 7 for the second measure up here. E flat 7 for the second measure down here. Then B flat 7 for the third and fourth measure up here. And the same down here. But notice there's music written up here. But there's no music written down here. And the reason why is because the music hasn't been written yet. The jazz musicians are going to create their own melody to these chords on the spur of the moment. We call that jazz improvisation. They're going to improvise that melody that they come up with on the spur of the moment, like spontaneous composition. And then each musician in turn can play solo, improvise as many times through these chords as they want. So in jazz, one time through the entire chord progression, whether you're playing the original melody, which was written by Sonny Rollins, or you're playing your own melody, which you're improvising on the spur of the moment, every time you go through those chords, it's called a chorus. Chorus, C-H-O-R-U-S. Now, chorus is one of these words that has different meanings depending on the kind of music you're talking about. In, in jazz, a chorus is one time through all the chords in the tune, or one time through the form of the tune. The form of this is a 12-bar blues. In rock and roll and pop music, a chorus is the middle part, or the hook. Uh, in vocal music, chorus is a group of singers. In musical theater, it's the singers and the dancers. But in jazz, a chorus is one time through all the chords in a tune. So here's how jazz works. You're go a jazz performance is going to consist of many choruses of that chord progression. One chorus, two choruses, three choruses, four, five, six, 20, 30, 40. It all depends on how long the musicians feel like playing. Now, the reason why it doesn't get boring is because every time they go through those chords, something else happens and the audience doesn't know what's going to happen because the musicians don't know what's going to happen next. Now, the very first chorus, they're going to play the melody, which jazz musicians call the head. Jazz musicians have their own lingo for a lot of things. So they call the written melody, the one written by Sonny Rollins in this case, the head. So the first chorus, they're going to play the head like Sonny wrote it. The second chorus, they might repeat the head if they want to, but if they repeat it, they might just harmonize it. In other words, add a harmony part. But notice there's no harmony written here. They're going to create that harmony part by ear using their knowledge of music theory. Music theory meaning how notes and chords go together. 
Then after they play the head a couple of times, then chorus after chorus after chorus, each musician in turn improvises a solo and they can solo for as many choruses as they want. For instance, if the saxophone player solos for one chorus, we say the saxophone player played one chorus. If the sax saxophonist goes through it twice, it's two choruses. Three times, three choruses. Ten times, ten choruses. As many choruses th as they want. Then when they finish, they nod to the next person and the next person takes a solo. Then, after everybody's finished soloing, they play the head again at the end. So, think of jazz like a sandwich. You got one piece of bread at the top, that's the first time they play the head. You got a piece of bread at the bottom, that's when they play the head at the end. And just like in a sandwich, all the good stuff is in the middle. All the delicious good stuff is in the middle. In jazz, all the solos are in the middle. So now we're going to play Tenor Madness for you, but we're going to break it down into its basic elements. And I'm going to show you all those elements chorus by chorus. So the first chorus, all you're going to hear are the basic chords. Like you'll hear B flat seventh with a B flat in the bass. The bass player will play B flat in the bass. And then we'll go to E flat seventh. And the bass player again plays the E flat in the bass and then back to B flat seven and so forth. Then the second chorus and the third chorus and the fourth chorus, I will show you what happens to make it sound, what the musicians do to make it sound more like jazz. When you finally hear the melody come in, that would actually be the first chorus you'd hear in a jazz performance. They always start off with the head. Remember, jazz is like a sandwich. You got that first piece of bread at the top and, the, and you'll have that head again at the end. That's the melody and all the good stuff in the middle. So. Without further ado, let's listen to the elements of Tenor Madness by the Herbie Hancock Institute National Peer-to-Peer -peer Jazz Septet. Notice there's four beats in each measure. E flat seven. One, two, three, four, B flat seven. One, two, three, four, C minor. Those are just the basic chords. Now, now notice the bass player is creating what we call a walking bass line. He's putting a note on each beat. Notice, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. He still lands on the roots like he lands on F, lands on B flat, but all the other notes are improvised. Now we take the drummer and he'll take his right hand on that ride cymbal over here and line it right up with the beat with the basses. Everyone's keeping their place. And here's the 11th bar and 12th bar. Now let's have the drummer add some jazz embellishments. He'll add some more embellishments rather than just playing that quarter note beat. He'll add a swing rhythm and he'll take that left hand on the drums and his right foot on the bass drum and have a musical conversation between his left hand and right foot. And he's embellishing even more now. And the bass player is adding some embellishments. So rather than just the quarter notes, he's giving some a D, And again, all that's improvised. Now rather than just those basic chords, let's have the pianist add some jazz chords. Notice he's got two hands on the piano now, adding more notes, sounding more like jazz. More interesting. Now, rather than just playing the chords when they change, he can add rhythmic variety by comping the piano anytime he wants. We call that comping because it comes from the word complement and accompany. Now the horns are gonna get ready to play the head now, and this is where the tune would actually start. This would be the first chorus. And they're starting off right, playing the music, just like Sonny Rollins wrote it, but with a nice swing feel. So this would be the first chorus, and bar 11, and top. Now they're repeating the head, 
but notice they're in harmony. But no harmony is written. They're doing the harmony part by ear, utilizing their knowledge of music theory. And now it's time for the solo. And we start off with tenor saxophone. We can start off with anyone we want. We start with tenor saxophone. That's Ephraim Dorsey. And he's from Baltimore. And we're at the top again. And this is Eben Dorsey playing the alto saxophone. And she's also from Baltimore. All improvised. And now it's time for the trombone solo. And that's Melvin Nimitz. He's from New Orleans. Let's see who solos next. And that's time for the guitar solo. And that's Kai Burns. He's from Los Angeles. Now time for the piano solo. And that's Josh Wong, also from Los Angeles. And now time for the bass solo. And that's Gabe Barnard. From Miami. Now after the bass solo, we're going to do a thing we call trading fours. And that's where we have a musical conversation with the drummer. The saxophone asks the drummer a four measure question, and the drummer answers. Everyone keeps their place. Alto saxophone answers the drummer. Drummer answers the alto saxophone. Again, everybody keeps their place. And we call it trading fours because everyone's playing four measures of soloing. And that's Lawrence Turner on the drums from Houston. Now everybody's soloed. We traded fours. Now we're playing the head again. So we know the tune is almost over. Notice the horn players are all in unison, meaning playing the melody right together with each other. And they're repeating the melody, but notice this time it's harmonized, but no harmony is written. They're harmonizing it by ear, utilizing their knowledge of music theory. That's how jazz works.